Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being with us here. We're very glad you're here. We pray our service will be a blessing to you. Ooh, ooh. Today, of course, is Ash Wednesday, and it's the beginning of the season of Lent. Uh, in, in the Bible makes reference to people repenting in sackcloth and ashes, and on occasion throughout the years, Christians sometimes would come to church on Ash Wednesday, put ashes on themselves as a sign that they were truly sorry for their sins. And of course, during the season of Lent, it, we often reflect on our sins, and we think of what Jesus went through to pay for those sins, and then, of course, we rejoice in the fact that he did make that payment, so we have forgiveness and eternal life. Uh, our season, or our, our Lenten season this year is going to use a lamb goes uncomplaining forth as its, as its theme. It's from one of the Lenten hymns. If you look at the last couple pages in your bulletin, you have information about the hymn and the author, so you can, you can look at those things if you'd like. Each Wednesday, we're going to look at one of those verses, and we'll look at some of the scriptural themes that are in those verses, and we'll reflect on those. Tonight, we're going to look at something from Psalm 23. So let's begin with the first hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. We pray. Almighty and merciful God, you are compassionate and gracious and always forgive those who turn to you. Create in us such new and contrite hearts that we may truly repent of our sins and obtain your full and gracious pardon. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, 
one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue by singing Psalm 51a. If you'd like to follow in the hymnal, we're on page 86. We'll continue by reading the first section of our Lord's Passion history. The festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. Jesus said to his disciples, You know that after two days it will be the Passover, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. They plotted together how to arrest Jesus in some deceitful way and kill him. But they said, not during the festival, or else there might be a riot among the people. Satan entered Judas called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and spoke with the chief priests and officers of the temple guard about how he could betray Jesus to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. He promised to do it and was looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them away from the crowd. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, Tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. They went and found things just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table with the twelve apostles. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. A dispute arose among the disciples about which of them was considered to be greatest. But he told them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not to be that way with you. Instead, 
Let the greatest among you become like the youngest, and the one who leads like the one who serves. For who is greater, one who reclines at the table, or one who serves? Isn't it the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have remained with me in my trials. I am going to grant a kingdom to you, just as my Father granted to me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the time had come for, to, for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the end. By the time the supper took place, the devil had already put the idea into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He got up from the supper and laid aside his outer garment. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, You do not understand what I am doing now, but later you will understand. Peter told him, You will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Lord, not just my feet, Simon Peter replied, but also my hands and my head. Jesus told him, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet, but his body is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Indeed, he knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garment, he reclined at the table again. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. You are right, because I am. Now, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I have given you an example so that you also would do just as I have done for you. Amen, amen, I tell you. A servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. He took a cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So far, the passion history, all we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds, we are healed. We'll continue with the next hymn verses.
will rise. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Amen. The words of God will consider on this Ash Wednesday are written in the 23rd Psalm. We read a portion of verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. This is God's word. Please be seated. In the name of our Savior Jesus, who has defeated death, and gives us life that will last forever, dear children of God. You know it, right? You know the truth. You are going to die. Yeah, I know that. I guess that normally I don't like to dwell on that fact, but I know it. And sometimes I think about it. You do that, you go to a funeral, and they're talking about death, and maybe it makes you feel a little uncomfortable. You see the person in the casket and makes you feel kind of queasy. Ever have that happen to you where uh, you were in maybe a fairly serious car accident or maybe you narrowly escaped what could have been a really serious car accident and you had that adrenaline surge through you and uh, the emotions inside almost shouting, I could have been killed. Hmm? Ever get sick? Maybe, oh, pretty severely sick? To the point where you wondered, is this going to be it? Hmm? Ever think about it? You ever wonder, when am I going to die? Ever wonder how you're going to die? Ever think about it? I hope that, uh, I hope it's not too painful. I hope it's, I hope it's not something that's going to be really, really scary. Man, I, if, I hope, I hope I go quick and easy. I hope maybe I just die in my sleep. Or maybe I have just have a, a quick heart attack and I'm just gone like that. Or maybe best of all, maybe Jesus will come back before I die. And then I'll never have to go through the process of dying and I won't have to worry about it at all. On the other hand, the Lord may, in his grace, give people more years to repent. And he'll come back not till sometime after I die, meaning maybe I am going to have to go through it. And I might wonder, what's it going to be like? Is it going to be scary? Uh, what am I going to have to go through? I mean, I know where I'm going to be, but sometimes I still feel afraid. And then I start to feel guilty because why am I afraid? I'm a Christian. Christians aren't supposed to be afraid to die. And yet there's times when I am afraid to die. Does that, what does that say about my faith? If I'm really this afraid to die at times, does that mean maybe I don't have any faith? And if that's the case, but oh man, then I really am scared at the thought of dying. Well, first things first. Saving faith is saving faith, regardless of how strong it is or regardless of how weak it is. Okay? You know Jesus died for you, and you trust because of what he did, you're going to be in heaven. 
that saving faith. By the grace of God, we have it. And the truth of the matter is, my faith isn't always as strong as it should be, but it's still faith, and through that faith, I'm saved. And the truth of the matter is, sometimes even the strongest of Christians might wonder and worry and be afraid. Even the strongest of Christians on occasion might be afraid to die. And what do we do? Well, we know what we do when we're afraid to die, eh? When we're, whenever we're afraid of anything, we go back to our Lord, we look to him, and we focus again on his words. We think of words like the ones before us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The most comforting thing to know, the Lord is with me. No matter what I go through in this life, he's with me. When I'm afraid of something, he's with me. If I think about dying and I'm afraid, I know he's with me. When it gets to that time and I am dying, I know he is with me. He'll be there. Death is going to come, but I know the Lord will be with me when I go through it. That's what we use as our theme as we look at these beautiful, comforting words before us today. And yeah, death will come, but the Lord will be with me when I go through it. And we'll see that he'll be with me, his presence, his special presence will be with me, his word will be with me, and his strength will be with me. It's nice sometimes to have somebody with you, especially if you're struggling, especially if you're afraid. And I, there's times when maybe we would like to just be alone by ourselves to work through something, but at the other time, boy, it's nice to have somebody with you, eh? Uh, the woman in the hospital, her husband is going through serious surgery, and she's wondering what's going to happen if he's going to make it, and her sister is there sitting with her, maybe not saying much, but she's there, and she's glad to have her support. The little girl who goes in for surgery, and she might be scared. She's scared when she goes under, and she starts to wake up, and boy, this is different. It's not her room. It's all, it's unfamiliar, and she starts to panic and cry, and mom comes, it's all right. I'm here. It's going to be okay. It's a comforting thing to have people with you at certain times in your life. And what a comforting thing to know that no matter what, the Lord is with me. We know Jesus' promise, right? Surely I am with you always. No matter where I am, no matter what I'm going through, Jesus is with me. You remember what the Lord said to Joshua. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's the comfort that I have. The Lord is always with me, no matter what I face, no matter how scary it might be. He's there to guide me, to help me, to do whatever it takes to see me through, to make sure that I'm always blessed. And that's what I can think about. If it happens that I'm thinking about dying and I'm afraid, or when it gets to that point in my life where I realize, oh, this is it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And again, there's questions that we might have. Normally, the Lord doesn't let us know exactly how we are going to die. Maybe when it gets to be time, he lets us know. Or Normally, he doesn't tell us ahead of time just how long we're going to live. There's times where the Lord puts us in the position where we have no choice but to put ourselves in his hands and to trust. I know, Lord, you have a plan. I know it's always right for me. I know you're always going to be with me. 
And he's, he's there no matter what, always by my side. And he's there also to give me the help that I need with his promises, with his words. It's, it's interesting sometimes to ask people why they're afraid to die. And some people might say, oh, I'm not afraid, okay? Well, when you're in good health and you're young and it seems like there's nothing threatening around you, uh, it's easy to say, oh, I'm not afraid. At other times, maybe it becomes rather real. And we talked about some of those things. Uh, you're with somebody and they're dying and all of a sudden you realize uh, people die. Uh, maybe you're not doing so well or again, you're in a near car accident and all of a sudden you realize what could have happened. Then what? Well, people are sometimes afraid. Why? Well, sometimes it's just the unknown, okay? Just what, what is it going to be like when I die? Um, is it going to be painful? Just what takes place? What, what are you going to have to go through? You know, you get weaker and weaker. You know, the thought of maybe not being able to breathe anymore kind of freaks me out. What, what's it going to be like? Hmm? Some people are afraid because they aren't sure or they really don't know what will happen to them when they die. They said, I hope there's something good. Or some people convince themselves there's nothing, so they tell themselves I shouldn't have to be afraid. But uh, deep inside, you just wonder if they're not really wondering. Some people are afraid because they do know what's after death, but they're not sure where they're going to be. Their consciences kick in. Death is the, really, in the end, the strongest preaching of law that there is. You lose your life, and you're going to stand before the Almighty God, and what's he going to say to you? And they think of the sins they've committed, the things they've done. What if God is really angry at me? What if he's not going to want someone like me after the things that I've done? Or some of them delude themselves with that lie, and we talk about it. They tell themselves, or they convince themselves, or they think this is the way it must be, because it dare not be any other way. But they think, I've done my best. I've tried hard to keep God's commandments. I've tried to make up for the things I've done. I've tried to do more good things than bad. Um, God's just going to have to be satisfied with that. And then they get closer and closer. Well, but what if he's not? Hmm? What if I didn't do enough good things? And what if I never really made up for the mistakes that I've made? And then they're terrified at the thought of what's going to happen. And the thing is, we, we know better. By the grace of God, we know better. But the devil can still try to mess with our minds. Uh, there's times you, you might lay there and wonder and think that, oh, what I did. And think back to maybe my teen years or other things. Oh, that was, how could I have done that? That was so awful. Maybe God still does hold that against me. Maybe he is angry at me for what I've done. When I stand before him and I have to answer for my past, what is he going to say? Maybe he's going to look at me and shake his head and say, we don't want you. And that's when I have to go back and tell myself the truth. When it, and sometimes the fear might be there. I'm dying and maybe God isn't going to be there to help me. I'm dying and he's not going to want me. Then again, remember, thou art with me. Why? Well, what are we going to do during Lent? Retrace Jesus' steps. Week after week, we'll review what he went through, and we're looking ahead to two extra special days and to two extra special announcements. Looking ahead especially to Good Friday and the words, it is finished letting us know that Jesus really did do everything necessary 
we are completely forgiven. God does not hold our sins against us. Because of what Jesus has done, we're just right for God, and when we stand before him, he's going to say, yes, I want you to be with me. And then, of course, we look ahead to that other day and to those glorious, wonderful words, he is risen, reminding us, hey, he really has taken care of our sins. His death really did pay for them. He really has won salvation. We really are going to live forever. See? And it gives us that joy then to know um, I am going to be with him. And I think of those words then, and if I ever struggle, and again, even the strongest of Christians might, God is with me, and he speaks to me in his word. And Jesus gives me that reminder, those who live and believe in me never die. Or again, to depart and be with Christ is better by far. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. We are going to live. We live here. We live in heaven. Either way, we live. That's God's promise. And somebody might say, yes, I know that. And it gives me comfort. But I still find myself being afraid sometimes. I, I still wonder what's going to happen and what I might have to go through. And then again, think of those words. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. God is with me, and he always gives me the help and the strength that I need to make it through. And sometimes, to make me strong, God will make me weak. I think again of the Apostle Paul and his thorn in the flesh, and God said, no, I'm not going to take it away. And Paul says, I'll rejoice. Why? Because this weakness forced him to trust in the Lord all the more. He says, when I am weak, I am strong. And there's times where the Lord will allow things to happen that force us to be weak so that we have no choice but to look to him and to trust in him. Hmm? And it may be that I'll get weak. Maybe I won't be able to get out of that bed Maybe I won't be able to feed myself anymore. Maybe I'll struggle to get a breath. And there's a part of me that might be afraid, and there's a part of me that just, in fact, all of me, Lord, help me, please, Lord, help me, please don't forsake me. The only thing I'm doing is focusing on him. The only thing I'm doing is calling on him. The only thing I'm doing is trusting he will help me. And when that's what I'm doing, when that's all I'm doing, that's when I'm strong. That's when I'm at my best. God will be there, and God will help. You think of the three-year-old starting preschool, or, some, or the first years of Sunday school, and you get to Bible stories, and they start learning Bible passages. And normally, one of the first stories would be the fall. And then they learn one of their first Bible passages. It's one really easy for a three-year-old. It's short and maybe not so sweet, but they know it. And they, they, I know what the Bible says, and they can say it so confidently. The wages of sin is death. They know it. Kind of neat Christmas Eve. That's one of the first things they say. A little on. Hmm? Then they get confirmed years later. And one of the passages we will use with them, be thou faithful unto death. A reminder again, oh yeah, death is coming. You get married. And what promise do you make? They've changed the wording, but many of us spoke the old vows, till death do us part. Now they say, as long as we both shall live, but the implication is still there. You know it's coming. You get older and older, who's going to go first, me or my spouse? And then you wonder about that, but you know it's coming. 
And there might be things that strike us and we might think about it. Again, being at a funeral, somebody dies suddenly, unexpectedly, and it shocks us. Or sometimes even something on TV might give you a jolt. Sometimes lying in bed there and you think about it and you're afraid. And what do you do? You look to your Lord and remember his promises, his words. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's what I, that's the comfort, the confidence that I have. If I'm thinking about it, even though it's a long way off, or when it gets to that time, and it's staring me in the face, and I realize this, this is it. I'm dying. Thou art with me. I will not be afraid, because I know he'll give me the strength. He will give me the help. And I know Jesus died and rose again. So I know exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to live forever. And while I'm here, God will help me. It's going to come. Death will come. But I know the Lord will be with me when I go through it. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We'll continue with the offering and we'll sing the posted hymn verses as we gather. Let's rise for our response of prayer tonight. If you're following in the bulletin, we're on page four. Holy and righteous God, our Father in heaven, today we begin another journey. Uh, we begin again the solemn journey of Lent. In our hearts and minds, we will once again travel with your Son from the upper room to Gethsemane, to Jerusalem, and to Golgotha. Once again, we will review all that he suffered in order to make the full and complete payment necessary for our sins. Help us to remember always, Lord, why his suffering and death were necessary.
Help us also to remember, Lord, that your son suffered all this willingly so that we could be rescued from the hell we deserve and be your dear children and one day be with you in the joys of heaven. May the greatness of Jesus' love and all that he suffered and all that he won for us move us to love our triune God all the more and to willingly follow and serve you in all our lives. Hear us, Lord, as we take time to silently reflect on all our Savior suffered, why he suffered, and what his suffering means for us. Praise be to you, O Lord, for your great love and all it has done for us. Hear us now as we join in praying the prayer your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. As we begin another season of Lent and reflect upon all that our Savior suffered because of our sins, let us approach our Lord in humility and confess our sins. Do you believe that you were sinful when your life started at conception and that when you were born you were sinful? Yes, I believe this. Truly, we should believe this, for the Bible teaches us. <coughs> Do you believe that you have sinned against the Lord in your thoughts, words, and deeds, and that you are not perfect as he requires? Yes, I this. Truly, we should believe and confess this, for the Bible says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you believe that you deserve death and God's curse and eternal punishment in hell because of your sins? Yes. Indeed, we should believe this, for the Bible says, In addition, the Bible says, Do you believe that God still loves you in spite of your sins and desires your salvation? Yes, I believe this. Truly, we should believe this. The scriptures tell us that,
you believe that God has forgiven all your sins because of Jesus' perfect life and innocent death? Yes, I believe. It is indeed fitting and proper for us to believe this comforting truth, for the Bible says, The scripture also assures us Do you believe that through faith in Jesus God gives you eternal life as a free gift? Yes, I believe. Indeed, may all of us believe this, for this is God's sure promise. What a wonderful blessing that the Holy Spirit has worked in your heart to lead you to believe these sacred truths. May the Lord be praised for his grace and for his goodness and mercy in your life. As is noted in the bulletin, we practice close communion, and therefore we ask only members of our congregation or another congregation in fellowship with us to come forward. By doing this, we don't mean to pass judgment on anyone's faith, but we know that while the Lord's Supper offers wonderful blessings, it can also cause great harm. So we always seek to study the scriptures with people before we invite them to receive the sacrament. We'll invite first of all those who wish to receive the, com the individual cup, rather, after that, those who would like to receive the common cup. During the distributions, our chimes will play a selection, and then we'll continue with the two posted hymns. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. We invite you now to come forward to receive the sacrament.
Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus, who gave his death to defeat death so that we might have life with the greatest blessings of all, life that will last forever. Thank you for giving us assurance of this and for strengthening our faith through this holy sacrament. May we go forward, Lord, living for you in joy, better motivated and equipped to serve you in our lives. Please keep us safe in your care, Lord, and please keep us all faithful until death so that we may have that crown of life. We pray this to you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The blood of Jesus, his Son, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. close with the final hymn. Thank you again for being with us. We're glad you're here. We pray God's word was a blessing to you. Uh, just a quick reminder, Saturdays we uh, set our clocks ahead, so we go to daylight savings time. And, well, why don't we join in the common table prayers, and we'll go and eat. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. We'll give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good for his mercy endures forever. Amen. Good evening, everyone, and God bless you.